all, my name is Catherine Ellen Foley and I am a health reporter at Quartz. Uh, it is my pleasure to be seated here today with Dr. Florian Kramer, a professor of vaccinology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai to talk more about COVID-19 vaccine distribution. It's really sobering day to have this conversation as this week we hit our one year anniversary of the first COVID-19 death um, and vaccine rollout has, has stalled a little bit in the US. I believe we're right around the two or 3% range Dr. Kramer, can you talk about what the biggest factor contributing to the slowness of this rollout? Was, was this at all predictable? Um, yes, I think so. Uh, these things are usually slow in the beginning. Um, health systems have to get used to uh, how they roll out the vaccine, um, how they get through to people, how they organize themselves in order to really vaccinate people at high rates every day. And so I think it always takes a little bit of time uh, to get this going. And uh, an addition, additional factor, of course, was that we had the holidays in between and that also slowed things down. So I hope that uh, we will, uh, in the next few weeks, really take up steam and uh, that the vaccination rates will uh, increase uh, dramatically. And can you tell us a little bit more about what this looks like on the ground? Is it, for example, healthcare providers needing vaccines, but they don't have enough doses to administer to people? Or, or are um, healthcare providers waiting to give vaccines to people who aren't coming in? Do you know which one of those is, is the holdup? I, I think right now we are already in a situation where the vaccines are there, uh, they are available. And the people are there too. Uh, so it's really um, making sure that uh, we can actually vaccinate a lot of people per day, uh, having smooth operations and ramping up the numbers of people that can be vaccinated per day. Uh, at Mount Sinai, for example, uh, there are now long lines of people waiting for the vaccine. The vaccine is there, they're getting vaccinated. And our vaccine operation is, uh, is basically running from six o'clock in the morning until late at night. Uh, and it's also uh, running on weekends. Uh, but it took some time to ramp that up. And it, uh, of course, takes time to, to get these operations smoothed out. And can you tell us what some of the early big lessons we've seen so far in the vaccine distribution process, especially in the US with a privatized healthcare system and, and in the UK uh, with a national healthcare system? Can we see what strategies are working well? Well, I guess um, the, the first, um, I wouldn't say problem, but the complication, of course, is uh, to figure out who is allowed to get the vaccine, right? And that's that was initially not so easy to figure out. There's a lot of confusion about that. Uh, and of course, there are differences between different states in the US, and that also adds to that confusion. Um, and I think it's very important to have clear guidelines here and to make sure that if you do this in phases, that's what we do in the US, that's what we do in New York, that is clearly communicated who belongs to which phase um, and uh, when somebody can get vaccinated. Uh, if there is less chaos and less questions about that, uh, operations are going smoother. You had said previously that it might take until late spring to make serious progress on vaccine rollout. Um, does this seem like a reasonable estimate still, or have your opinions changed um, based on what we've seen so far? No, I think that's still a reasonable uh, assumption. Of course, there are countries like Israel that uh, go at a much, much faster pace, and Israel is, is now above 20% in terms of vaccination rate. And that's something that uh, I hope we will uh, basically get to here as well relatively soon. So I'm very confident that uh, until late spring we'll have a good vaccination rate, specifically in high risk populations. That's where it's most important because that's where the vaccines will um, prevent uh, people from dying and, or getting uh, severely sick. But what about on a larger global scale? What about other countries? Do you think there's a role for developed richer countries to be sharing resources um, with, with poorer countries? How should that look globally? Yes, and there, is a few, there are a few uh, global systems in place um, managed by the WHO, by CEPI, uh, that really look at vaccine distribution and, and uh, look at uh, making sure, are looking at making sure that uh, all countries actually get a fair share of vaccines. 
we'll have to see how well that will work out. But there's also other examples, uh, Canada, for example, ordered uh, more vaccine that they will need for their population, and they pledge to uh, donate any vaccine that they will not use. So there is uh, different ways of doing that, but of course, uh, the best situation would be a, a, a fair distribution of vaccines globally right away. That's what uh, we would uh, hope for. I also want to look a little bit at what other, going back to this issue of comorbidities and prioritizing people, um, certain states in the U.S. have stated that um, certain comorbidities like obesity might move someone up a priority list or be included in a, in a higher priority list. Um, my question is, what would that look like for a country like the U.S. where obesity is so prevalent? Um, is that going to complicate distribution further? I don't think it's going to complicate it further, but of course there are, in, in all uh, high-income countries, there is a, a larger proportion of people with these kinds of comorbidities, uh, like uh, obesity or diabetes, uh, that might put you at higher risk. So I don't think this is going to uh, make the distribution of the vaccines more uh, difficult. It just changes who gets prioritized. Um, and I'm, I'm also wondering what some of the new strains of COVID-19 um, mean for vaccine distribution. Uh, we've seen this more contagious strain um, that was first discovered in, in, I guess, the UK is now present in 33 countries and across several states in the US. Will this change how we go about distribution? Um, I hope, and I might be right, it might speed things up. Um, we know uh, some things about these strains. Uh, it really seems to be the case that the UK variant is more contagious, uh, but there's first data that uh, is now getting uh, published uh, that the vaccine-induced immunity still works well against the UK variant. There are other variants like the South African variant and the other variants that, uh, that uh, were found globally um, in, in different countries where we don't know that much yet about uh, how well the vaccine might work against them. But uh, if anything, I think uh, we should take the uh, emergence of these variants as a sign that we need to speed up with the vaccination rates. <laughs> Um, any kind of challenge there because most of the vaccines in the pipeline so far have all targeted the virus's spike protein. Is there any concern that perhaps if all of the vaccines being rolled out are targeting the same thing, they will become ineffective if the virus mutates around that? So only antibodies that target this spike protein can neutralize the virus. Uh, it's very unclear. It, it's very, it's unclear if um, vaccines that would uh, really um, solely target other proteins would even be protective. So the spike is our best bet. Now, the spike protein is huge, and there are many different sites on the spike that can be uh, attacked by antibodies and that uh, lead to virus neutralization. Uh, those um, sites are on the receptor binding domain of the spike. They're in other domains as well. And so if one of these domains cha uh, changes uh, through mutation, uh, the hope is that there is uh, enough other uh, places for antibodies left to bind. And when we get vaccinated, we make a, a huge variety of antibodies. There's a lot of diversity. And so the hope is that even if the virus changes, uh, that the vaccines will still be able to protect us. Now, the important thing is that we need to evaluate that for uh, newly emerging variants to make sure that this is really still the case. Um, my other question regarding, um, I guess, new vaccines becoming available to the public is, does this, is the fact that there are currently vaccines available, does that change the way that clinical trials will have to be run for um, vaccine candidates that are, you know, earlier in development or, or just haven't gotten there yet? What does that look like? Yeah, it's getting much more complicated um, because, of course, if you have already vaccines that have uh, use authorization and that seem to work well, um, there is not much incentive for people to enroll in a trial, specifically if they're already in line for the vaccine. And uh, the higher the vaccination rate, the fewer people you will have who would sign up for a new vaccine trial. And at some point, you probably cannot do vaccine trials against the placebo control group anymore, meaning a, a group that doesn't receive any vaccine. It might have to be uh, trials where you vaccinate with uh, already licensed vaccines and your vaccine that you're investigating, and then you compare rates 
of infection. Now, that would require uh, much larger trials, but because of course, then you register way fewer cases. So <clears throat> of course, having vaccines that work and that are rolled out make development of new, new vaccines uh, uh, makes that much harder. But on the other side, uh, we are trying to uh, determine correlates of protection, meaning types of immunity that we can measure that would tell us if somebody is immune or not. For example, how much antibody does somebody have? And is that enough to be protected? And then you can look if a certain vaccine reaches that level of antibody uh, in a certain person, and you might be able to license vaccines based on the correlate of protection. This is something that is actually done for influenza viruses. It might take a while until we are there, uh, but that's certainly another possibility of, of uh, licensing uh, SARS coronavirus 2 vaccines once we reach the very high vaccination rate with the, with the regular vaccines already. And I'm also wondering, I mean, in the meantime, if, if you are low on those vaccine priority lists or, and, and you know, we've been going through this pandemic for a long time, what are some things that we can continue to do to protect ourselves from uh, the, current, the current strain that might be going around in our communities as well as the, the more contagious strain um, and other mutations we've seen? Um, so basically the same uh, precautions could be taking wearing masks, sanitizing your, your hand, sanitizing your hands, washing your hands, uh, practicing social distance, social distancing. Um, and we know that these things work even against viruses that are far more contagious uh, than SARS coronavirus 2. For example, measles virus uh, can be prevented by the same measures. You just have, have to follow them strictly. Uh, and you have to be very careful. But even uh, a variant of the virus that is a little bit more contagious can be stopped by uh, relatively simple measures if they are adhered to. Uh, and that's the important point. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Kramer. Um, best of luck with your future research.